I've got a brand new screen kit installed. It is a touch screen OLED display for the Game Boy Color. And wow, it looks incredible. So I've managed to get my hands on one of these OLED displays that have been popping up on AliExpress for the Nintendo Game Boy Color. Now up to this point, the best displays are IPS screens, similar to what you would get in a Nintendo DSi, for instance. But these are more akin to the sort of displays you'd expect to find in a modern smartphone. And the difference is incredible. So the kit I ordered came not only with the screen, but also the shell and all the other bits I needed, aside from the original Game Boy itself. And in this video, I'll be walking you through the steps to install and set up this incredible little handheld. So first of all, a quick word about tools. You will need a crosshead screwdriver. I found a Philips One worked quite well. And a tri-point screwdriver, which is actually quite big on the Game Boy color so I used a Y3 bit both of those worked fine for the entire job there is a small amount of soldering involved so you will need a soldering iron and some solder and you might also find a pair of scissors and some tweezers to be useful during the installation you can buy this kit on its own but as it's a laminated screen it needs one of the IPS ready shells and as it's only an additional five pounds to get one of those in the bundle it seemed foolish not to I went with yellow as a can't resist the yellow Game Boy. It's just the best color on those things. I've done a lot of clear shells recently, so I wanted a solid color for a change. So I got the screen kit with the shell included. The shell itself has a widened screen aperture. It's got the ground shield pre-installed and the battery contacts are pre-installed as well. Then you've got your screen adapter PCB, which has the large ribbon cable already attached in place. The screen itself has a glass lens laminated to the front and another PCB attached to the back. There's a self-adhesive strip running around the sides and the top to secure it in place onto the shell. It comes with a large sheet of insulating film and a sheet with plenty of strips of capped on tape. So you've got more than enough to insulate any exposed metal areas on your PCBs or secure any wires in place prior to reassembly. Now there is a little bit of soldering required to connect power to the main board. However, they have made it as easy as possible in the design. There is one contact point on the motherboard and it already has solder in place. They provide you with a wire that's cut to the right length, stripped at the ends and tinned at the tips. So it's really easy to get that in place, even if you've only got minimal soldering experience. And I'll show you how to do all that anyway. So included with the shell is a set of buttons and conductive silicon pads, a bag of screws and a cover for the infrared sensor. There's also a sticker to go on the back of the shell when you're all done. Now while the buttons and membranes that come with the shell kit are perfectly serviceable, if you combine the shell, which is good quality, with your original buttons and membranes, you'll get a really authentic experience with much more responsive controls. So I would advise going that route if your original buttons are in good shape. Alternatively, you can buy some high quality upgrades from somewhere like Z-Labs in a whole range of different colors. And in addition to all of this stuff, of course, you will also need a fully working Game Boy Color console. All you need to harvest from that is the motherboard and if you're using them, the buttons and the membranes. I had a faulty unit that I repaired prior to this build. The battery contacts weren't working and the switch was faulty. Turned out it had sand in it for whatever reason. Anyway, that's all fully working now, but the screen and shell had seen better days, so it was a perfect candidate for a build like this. Incidentally, if you've got an original Game Boy Color in perfect condition, I would be tempted to keep it that way. There's not as many of those about in that state anymore, and there's plenty of battered ones out there. If you only need the motherboard from the inside, generally they're in pretty good condition. It's just the outside that takes a beating. So if you've got an original Game Boy Color, in excellent condition, I would keep it as it is and try and track down a more suitable donor for your project. Anyway, of course, that is all up to you. So first, taking out the motherboard. Now, I was using the build tray that I've shown on here before. That's still in the prototype stages, but I am working towards developing a solution on that one, and I should have some available for sale soon if anyone is interested. With the console face down, remove the six tri-point screws. There's also two in the battery compartment and lift off the rear shell. Then swap to a crosshead driver and remove the three screws securing the motherboard in place. Next, slide open the clip securing the screen ribbon in place and lift the motherboard, gently removing the screen ribbon from its socket. Inspect the contacts for the buttons as sometimes these will need cleaning for a better contact. A pencil eraser does the job just fine, otherwise a cotton bud with some contact cleaning fluid or alcohol just rubbed over those contacts will make them much more responsive when in use. I'd already cleaned and tested mine when I was repairing the console earlier and again, 
it was well worth doing. Take out the conductive membranes and the buttons and then take the front shell and the rear shell and put them to one side. You won't need those for the rest of the build. So as I said, I wanted to use my original buttons and they did need a bit of a clean. Some patient work with a toothbrush, cotton buds and some cleaning fluid restored them to a much nicer state. If you cut the cotton buds in half at an angle, it gives a good sharp point to scrub at the more stubborn dirt without risking scratching the plastic. I finished off by polishing them with a soft cloth. So just taking a moment to compare these buttons with the ones that were supplied in the kit, there are some subtle differences. The replacement buttons are very slightly translucent and a slightly lighter shade of grey. The D-pad has a shallower nub on the back, possibly better suited to the thicker membranes that come with the kit, but it might well make for a less responsive directional input. Also, there's a slight texture to the surface, but that may well because the original ones are just worn from more use, but the original one I definitely find more comfortable to use. The A and B buttons are noticeably flatter than the originals and feel really different when in use. The power switch cover is also worth keeping from the original console as the quality of the molding on the replacement one isn't quite as good, the lines aren't quite as defined. And another thing I've found in the past is that sometimes the reproduction switch covers can end up being a little bit too big and can be a bit of a tight fit in the shell. So definitely use the original one if you've still got it. So now it's time for the assembly. And while I was waiting for my kit to arrive, I watched a few different installation videos on some of my favorite YouTube channels. And it was interesting to see that everybody takes a slightly different approach or carries out a slightly different sequence when they're doing their builds. In this case, I'll be using the sequence that I think is the most straightforward and logical and avoids any steps being accidentally missed out. So first you're gonna take the screen and attach it to the front shell. It's a very snug fit that requires a little bit of pressure and it's best doing it while there aren't any other delicate parts in place. Have the shell facing upwards and peel off the backing strips from the self-adhesive areas around your lens. You'll be inserting the bottom of the screen inside the shell first. There's a tab on the lower left of the protective film on the screen lens. Make sure you lift this slightly so it doesn't get pinched between the screen and the shell. With the bottom end in place, apply gentle pressure at the top two corners to clip the lens into place and then run your fingers around the edges to make sure it's stuck down. Have a proper check to make sure it's sitting level all the way around the edge of the screen. Now get your secondary PCB. There's a slot in the middle and a ribbon with a clip on the back of the screen. The ribbon needs to feed through the slot and it helps to lift it a little bit first so it doesn't sit completely flat. There's a connector on the PCB and a corresponding one on the end of the ribbon. Fold the ribbon over, make sure the two are correctly aligned and apply a little bit of pressure until you feel them click together. So now for your first bit of soldering. There's a contact point on the PCB marked as BAT for your battery with solder already on it. Angle your wire so that it leads towards the top of the shell. Hold the end of the wire near the blob of solder. Heat the solder with your soldering iron and allow the bare end of the wire to move into the center of that blob. Hold it steady while it cools and give it a gentle tug to make sure it's secured in place. After this, I wanted a layer of insulation between the PCB and the Game Boy motherboard. So I cut the self-adhesive film down to size and laid it over the exposed PCB. It doesn't really stick right down, but it's not about holding things in place. It's just about providing a barrier between the two circuit boards. And in this case, it does the job just fine. Now put your buttons in place. The D-pad and the A and B will only fit one way, so you'll definitely get those right. Then the start and select button and silicon membranes, which in this case needed a little bit of a rub to get them clean. They locate on little pins, which are self-explanatory to secure them in place. Now at this point, there's still quite a lot of movement available in the main ribbon, so I would take advantage of that and attach the ribbon to the motherboard before you put the motherboard in place. Just make sure that the two clips are open on the ribbon slot, slide the ribbon in as far as it'll go, and then pinch and clip those two connectors in place. Now put the motherboard into the shell, starting by getting the speaker in place and then lowering the rest of the motherboard with the holes located around the screw posts. The wire that you soldered earlier should be up at the top, just to the left of your screen ribbon. Now my board didn't sit flat on the first attempt, so I double checked the buttons, membranes and screen kit were all aligned correctly, lowered it in position and tried again. When you've established the motherboard sits flat with no obstructions, it's time to insert the three crosshead screws and secure it in place. So at this point, I realized I was missing one of my crosshead screws for putting the motherboard in. I looked everywhere. I assumed I'd probably dropped it on the floor or something like that. So I took one of the screws from the new set and went ahead and put it together with that. However, when I was reviewing the footage, I noticed that it was 
as I pass the motherboard across the row of screws in my build tray, the speaker, which is of course magnetic, must have attracted one of the screws. No wonder I had trouble fitting it in place. Um, as soon as I realized that, I took it all apart again, opened up, and indeed one of the screws was on the front of the speaker. Thankfully, no damage was done. It's now removed and everything's working absolutely fine. But this is why I prototype and test these things before sharing them. So in this case, I am gonna redesign slightly where the screws are located so that they are nowhere near the magnetism of the speaker when you're doing your builds. Anyway, on with the reassembly. I use my original screws as these are good quality. I had them handy and they are still in good condition. These are fresh screw posts. So you'll be cutting a new thread into them. Make sure you tap the thread by repeatedly unscrewing slightly after every turn. You want them all snug, but don't over tighten. When the screw stops turning, leave it. So now you've got the next bit of soldering to do. Look on the switch for a point marked C. That's where the end of your wire is gonna connect. I started by heating up that point and adding a little bit of additional solder just to make the job easier. And then I angled my wire so that it was pointing towards the switch and it's less likely to end up causing a bridge between any of the other points on the switch. Again, hold the wire in position, heat the blob of solder, allow the wire to settle in there, let it cool, and it should be fine. Now the wire provided is long enough to make it very comfortable to do the soldering, but ends up a little bit overly long to just put in place. Now I didn't want to risk pinching anything. So we reroute the wire carefully and then a bit of the supplied capped on tape to just secure it down in place as it weaves its way between all the components on the PCB. So before the final reassembly, put the power switch cover in place, making sure it's aligned with the switch itself and click it into the off position. Then get the infrared cover and slide that into position. I used the new one as my original one was scratched. It only goes one way around and there's a slight bevel on top that slopes towards the front of the console. When you've pushed that in place, carefully lower the rear shell in position and make sure it fits neatly all the way around. Then use your tri-point driver to put the six remaining screws in, again, tapping new threads as you go. Insert your batteries and put the battery cover on. Peel the back off your sticker and carefully stick it in place. Peel off the protective film from the screen, make sure your volume is turned up and it's time to switch it on. With any luck, it will work. It's kind of a tricky one because you can't test it earlier because you haven't attached that power wire. And although you could kind of temporarily solder it in place, I wasn't patient enough to do that and just plowed ahead with the relentless optimism that I always do. And thankfully this time it worked. And wow, that moment when you switch it on, oh, it looks good. Like I am used to the IPS screens. They look good. I did the FPGBC recently with the larger size screen and that looks incredible. I'm loving playing on that, but this really is amazing. The key difference here is not just the clarity, not just the depth of color, but the blacks. Like there's no backlight invisible behind those points. Even if you were in a dark room, the black areas look really black and the contrast on the display as a result is superb. Now, if your console doesn't work, don't despair, just open it up, retrace your steps and see if there's anything that you missed or something that needs readjusting or fixing. Usually it's something quite simple. Fingers crossed you'll get there in the end. So as well as the fantastic quality of display on this unit, as I mentioned before, there is a touchscreen input to work your way through the settings and it works pretty well. It's a capacitive touchscreen, so you don't need to have a stylus handy. You can use your finger just like you would on your smartphone. However, don't expect it to be quite as responsive. These are older screens that were actually intended for use on BlackBerry phones, so the technology is a little older, particularly in terms of the touchscreen. So while it works, it's not quite as responsive as you might be used to. Tap and hold with your finger in the lower half of the screen to bring up the main menu. Tap on the arrows. It's tricky to get the sweet spot, but persevere, it does work. So at the top, you can alter the brightness. You can select a color mode, which is more for the original Game Boy games to change your color palettes, really. But for me, mode one behaves just like the original Game Boy color and looks great on all games. For the pixel effect, you can emulate vertical or horizontal scan lines or a full pixel grid. But with a screen like this, I'd advise just ignoring all of those and embracing the new technology. So to access more menus, swipe up or down. You'll need to swipe a little more slowly if you're finding it won't respond. The next menu allows allows you to enable or disable frame blending, which can help address flickering in certain games. And you can alter the horizontal or vertical positioning of the screen if need be, although the positioning on mine was perfect to begin with. Swipe down to the next menu and you'll find the most exciting option there where you can change the different colors of the Game Boy Color logo on the bezel of the screen. You can work your way through and look at all the different colors and pick something that goes with your shell or buttons to set off that whole aesthetic. You can also reset the screen settings if you wanna get it back to its original state. 
So I've been playing a lot on this and I am absolutely blown away with how good this screen is. The shell feels authentic, it's an absolute joy to play and not only for the Game Boy Color games, but the original Game Boy games display really well on here too. But this video was more about the build process and an introduction to the fact that this technology actually exists now, isn't that amazing? So I'm planning another video coming soon which will look more in depth at testing this out and also compare it to some other units that I've built recently such as the iPad. PS Game Boy Color with the laminated screen and of course the more recent FPGBC. Now if you want to catch that you might want to subscribe and sign up for notifications and if you want to further support the channel again please take a look at the link for Z Labs in the description. It's an affiliate link so you'll be supporting my channel but you'll also get yourself a nice little discount on anything you buy from that awesome website. Now as I say it is incredible how many kits are coming along at such a rate in this modding community. It is amazing that it's still going all this time after the original release of these consoles. And it's not long ago that I did a video on the FPGBC, which is amazing in that it doesn't need, like this one did, an original Game Boy motherboard inside it. It is made from all new parts. I am going to be comparing this to it soon, but if you want to find out a little bit more about that and the build process involved, if you wanted to get one for yourself, then check out the link that I've got popping up here. I think you'll really like it. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.